the last installment of this series, The Last Words of Jesus, where we're just taking these final seven statements, and today's the final one, and we're learning how to endure the most difficult days that are ahead of us, the painful seasons, the trials, um, the, the terrible day, you know, that just where everything is going wrong. Jesus is teaching us here in these last words, these last statements, how he endured. And so we're just applying how, we're studying how Jesus did it, and we're applying it to our life and to our season so that we can overcome, so that we can have a resurrection ourselves, so we can be victorious even in our trials and in our painful seasons. Because this was, it was the most difficult day of Jesus' life, and he's sharing with us these principles of of enduring these principles of victory in order to overcome those things. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it's kind of our theme verse for this series, which basically just says, keep your eyes on Jesus. That's what we've been doing, looking to the cross. And it says, study how he did it. And that's what we're doing. We're studying how Jesus was victorious. How in the middle of the pain, in the middle of that trial, how did he, man, what, what, what was the, how did he process his pain? How did he process that trial? Because every believer needs a, it needs, needs a tool or needs to be able to process a framework of processing your bad, your bad days. So we're going to use Jesus' framework. Study how he did it, the Bible says, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, and he could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever, whatever the day he had. And now he's there in that place of honor right alongside of God. So we can learn how to live through our terrible days and our bad seasons um, by watching how Jesus handled his worst day ever. So we're taking these seven things Jesus said while on the cross and together we're, we're studying how he did it. Now let me remind you now, though, that, that this is all one day. So these are all, these seven principles, we studied six. These are all the things that need to be applied to our life um, on that day when it hits the fan. On that day where it's, trial or difficulty or pain on, on that day. Now, if you want to endure and, and overcome, if you want to be victorious, you cannot pick and choose which principles you want to operate by. You, you have to be able to apply the whole counsel of God's word, the whole counsel of what Jesus is sharing us in these statements, if you want to overcome and be victorious. It's, it, and so let me go back over them. Let me go back over the six that we've studied because on, on the seventh principle we're going to share today, it, it just doesn't matter if you haven't done the six. Okay, does that make sense? It just, you, it, these six are imperative in order to get the seventh principle that, that Jesus is sharing. So let me, let me, if you miss, you can go watch them online, but let me just recap the statements Jesus made in week one. Jesus, the first thing he said was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The title of the message there was Be Forgiving. This was the very first thing that Jesus did on his worst day. And, and, and therefore, it's a principle. I believe there's, there's an, an, an importance of priority. There's what the Bible calls the first things or the, the law of first mention is what it's called. What, what like professors and theologians call it is the law of first mention. The things that are mentioned first in the scriptures carry more weight, carry more more authority. And so here what Jesus is sharing with us is like, look, you, you're not to forgive them once you've stood about it for long enough. Uh, over, once uh, after a month or years down the road, no, you're supposed to forgive them first, like on that day that it happens of the pain or the humiliation or the manipulation or, or whatever it was, it's, it's forgive them, God. That's, that's, that's number one thing we need to do in that difficult season. And the second thing, same day, second thing, week number two, we talked about Jesus' second statement. He said, today you'll be with me, talking to the thief next to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. And the title there was, be compassionate, that even in the middle of your pain and in your trial, that, that God can use that, that, that it just may be that that trial actually just sets you up to be a minister to someone in need. That that trial, just because you're on that cross, you're able to minister to someone else on that same cross. Who better to minister to an alcoholic than someone who's struggled through alcoholism? Who better to minister to someone who's been through divorce than someone who has endured that divorce and has come out victorious on the other end, healed and whole and free? Who better? Be compassionate. He said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. The third statement Jesus made was to his mom, 
looking down at her from that cross. And, and he says, woman, behold your, your son, talking about John. And, and, and the principle we, we talked about there was to be aware that in, in, in the middle of your, your pain and your difficult season and trial, it's so easy to become self-consumed. And just, just focusing on our own needs, our own self, our own issues, our own pain, and, and, to, and to miss the ministry moments that God has right in front of your eyes. To miss the hurt, the difficulty, the trials that God, that God would have you reach into and bring hope and bring healing. So he said, hey, be aware. Week number four, the fourth statement, Jesus said, my God, my God, and, and we, we do this very often. He asked the question, Why? Why, God, why, why, is this, why is this happening to me? And the, the, the message there was be assured, be assured that you can trust God. He is trustworthy, that there are some things that you will never understand on this side of heaven. And that's okay, because we can be assured that he's working for our good. Like even with your questions, that's okay. You can be assured. Here's the fifth statement Jesus made. And, and he demonstrated his need for help. He said, I thirst. He asked for a drink. I'm, I'm thirsty. So we talked about being transparent there. Now this is, again, this is all on the same day. If you want to endure and be victorious, you need to apply every one of these principles to that difficult season. That, that if, the, if King Jesus himself needed help on his difficult day, on the worst day of his life and his trial, then you and I better take notice of that and stop hiding and be transparent. And stop, stop acting like we got it together and we don't need other people in our lives and isolating ourselves and just tell other people, look, I'm thirsty. Hey, I'm broken. Hey, I'm afraid. Hey, I, 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 my marriage is suffering. Hey, I, whatever it is, just to, to, if you want to endure and be victorious, you need to apply the pr- principle of being transparent and letting other people into your pain. Amen. Letting other people into that season and into that, into that day. The sixth statement we just did last week was, it is finished, that declaration. And we said there, be confident. Man, you can be confident because it is finished. That, that we, we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. We are victorious. So we can be confident that there is a purpose in the middle of our pain. Amen. And that there is an end. That there is a purpose and that there is an, an end. Now, all these need to be applied. And I... On, on the day, on that day, on that season, and every day. And, and I, I don't know about you during this season, if you've had a tough day or not, but I've had a couple of them. And so, so just last week, I had, a, I had a bad day. I had a really, really bad day. And, and, uh, and it, was, it was a day that nothing was going right. Everything was going wrong. And I had a, I had a choice. I was reminded by what my own words in the word of God. And I could have chosen to not be forgiven and to point the finger of blame and to, and to, and to, and to not be aware of the needs around me. I, I could have, I, and, I, and honestly, I've done that often in my life, just like you. And, and the result of that was not victorious when I made the wrong choices, when I didn't apply God's word to my life. Man, it was, it was more, more pain is what it was. It didn't help at all, but this last week I had a difficult day and I'm telling you, I, just these, the, the word of God and what I was, I was preaching to myself basically preparing me for that bad day that came because I was remembering it. And I was, and so I was being forgiving and compassionate and considerate. And I applied all these principles and I'm telling you, I mean, it was, it turned out to be an amazing experience because our team came so much closer. Our, we, we, we were solution oriented. We, 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 we grew and we went to the next level as a team because of a very, very bad day. And it was all because of the way that, that we responded to that day. Here's the seventh principle that Jesus has to share from us. And this is just before he breathed his last breath in Luke chapter 23. I'm going to give you the context up here in uh, verse 44 through 46. It says, it was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour for the sun stopped spinning and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, and we're told that that, is, that happened at the declaration that Jesus made. It is finished. Now, for those of you that don't know, like, like Bible and, and Old Testament, the, the temple he's talking about is the, is, is the temple in Jerusalem, and there was these, these most holy courts 
It was a holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was and only the priests were allowed to go into and to, and to make prayer and intercession for the people. It was only allowed, only the priests on certain times was he allowed to go in there. But we were told that, that at the time Jesus said, it is finished. And, and at the time that the final sacrifice was made, that the debt was paid, that that curtain that separated that holiest place was torn in two and the spirit of God burst out of that temple and now indwells in every believer. It is finished. That's what he's talking about. The, 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 the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice. Here's the seventh statement. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last breath in order to live through that painful season Indeed, you guys, to conclude it is to place it into the hands of God and leave it there. You want to endure through, your, through, the, through the painful season, through your trial? After you've done those six things we've just read, apply the seventh principle to your life. Here it is. Write it down this way. Finally, surrender your day to God and let it go. Finally, surrender that situation to God and let it go. Even though Jesus felt abandoned by his father, he surrendered total control of his life to his father's hands. See, the sixth word was, a, was about triumph. It was a word of triumph and victory. But the seventh statement Jesus makes is the statement of trust. It's a statement of trust. At some point, you have to stop Give up and give it to God. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him. Do you know that God does not want you living with anxiety? Do you know that's not his plan for you to live with anxiety? To live with to live with that fear or that doubt or that worry. That's not his plan. Like you're like like he's he the Bible says to cast, to throw, to unload, to to like you're supposed to get rid of that, not hold on to that anxiety. Right, Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And it's so hard, especially when you're going through it, right? When you're in the middle, I mean, when you're not going through it, it's easy to, to like trust God and those things. But in, the, in that season, it's so hard to just let it go. And then even when we do, when we do let it go, we still worry about it right? We still find a way to worry about it. We may come and leave it at an altar. We may have a good worship experience. God, you're going to do it again. And yes, God. And then we pick it back up Monday. We start worrying about it again. Maybe sometimes even the same day for some of us. It's so easy to let it go and, and maybe pick it back up. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. I love the Living Bible translation of this. He says, don't worry about anything. That's easier said than done, but this is God's will for you. And I'm going to show you why and how in just a moment. Don't worry about anything. Like that's God's plan for you. God does not want you living in worry. Not one second. Oh, but, but wait, what if, what if this happens to my job? No. Nope. What if the doctor tells me? No. Nope. What if, what if my financial? No, no. Do not worry about anything. Instead, Pray about everything. Tell God your needs. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than any human mind can understand. Worry is essentially a control issue. You're trying to control the uncontrollable, the the root word. The root, root word, a lot of you know this. I talk about it a lot, but that root word of that word worry means to choke. Or to strangle. Another, another word could be divide. That's what it means. And a lot of you have felt that when you're worried. You feel like, you know what? I shouldn't be worried. I should be trusting God. And there's this division. You have this divided mind where you're filled with doubt and what if. And a part of you is saying, but no, he's faithful. No, he'll do it again. He did it before. And you feel the division of your mind when you're, when you're worried. Let's see how good you guys are at worrying I think, I think we, we, we become very good, very professional worriers. Let me give you some worry statements, and I'm going to see if you can finish it, okay? Just shout it out. I'm going to give you a statement and see how good you are at worrying, okay? I'm ready to throw in the... See, you guys know how to do this. You guys know how to do it good. Okay, I'm, I'm at the end of my... 
There you go. I'm just a bundle of nerves. Some of you are really good. You need that one, okay? My life is falling apart. I'm at my wits and I feel like resigning from the human race. There you go. See, you guys are pros at stress. You guys have said these statements multiple times, many, many days. Here, listen, let me ask you a question. What has got you worried today? When you think about that, bring, bring to your mind right now before the grace and the throne and the presence of God right now, what has got you worried today? What is, what is causing you to lose your peace? Maybe lose your sleep? Maybe to lose your nerves and lose your mind? What has got you consumed today? Today's outline is an outline of just of one chapter, Jesus' famous teaching on this topic of worry. Jesus thought worry um, was, so, was such an important topic that he spent a large portion of his most famous sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount, talking about this topic called worry. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us four reasons you should never worry about anything. Four reasons. Let me, let, me, let me give them to you from Jesus says, number one, about worry. He says that worry is unreasonable. Worry is unreasonable. Like, like there's no reason to it. There's not, there's, it's illogical meaning. Worry is illogical. It makes no sense. Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says this. He says, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your life and all those what ifs. What's going to happen? What's not going to happen? Don't, don't, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or about your body or what you're going to wear. Is not life more important than those things that you're consuming yourself with? Isn't there more to this life? Is not the body more important than clothes? Why is worry unreasonable? A couple reasons, not in your notes. But, but first, because worry exaggerates the problem. Worry magnifies the problem. Doesn't that what it does? You never worry about something and the problem shrinks. No, no, you worry about it and the problem gets larger in your mind. You ever have someone like say something bad about you and you think about it so much, you know, that the more you think about it, the bigger it gets. And then you made it an even bigger problem the way you responded to it. Yeah, most of us can attest to that. We, 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 we exaggerate problems and we blow them out of proportion by worrying. Not only is it the great exaggerator, worrying is, but worry doesn't work. That's why it's unreasonable and illogical, because it just doesn't work. Worry has never solved any of your problems. Worry has, it's worthless. It doesn't make a difference in your life. Someone said worry is like a rocking chair. It's always in motion, but it never gets you anywhere, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's illogical. It's unreasonable, you guys. So why do we struggle with it? And and what good does it do? Worry essentially is the opposite of faith. And it steals our peace. It, it, it physically wears, it, wears us out. And even worry can even make you physically sick. It can cause bodily harm. And when we worry, we're just tormenting ourselves. We're doing the, je- the devil's job for him when we consume ourselves with worry. Worry is unreasonable. Here's the second thing Jesus says, that worry is unnatural. It's unnatural. Why is it unnatural? Did you know that, that human beings are the only, only thing in God's creation that worries? Human beings. Worry is a learned behavior, but the good news is if you learn how to worry, you can unlearn how to worry. You can unlearn it. Jesus says in verse 26 of the Sermon on the Mount here, he says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, Yet your heavenly father, notice he says your heavenly father. He's not talking about the bird's heavenly father. He's saying your heavenly father. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? If God is your heavenly father and you are his child, you know children get special privileges? Do you know that? And children of royalty get treated royally. You have a good father. That's why you you don't have to worry. It's unnatural. So what are you worrying about? The birds don't worry. And God's not their father. God's their creator, but he's not their father. By the way, since worry is unnatural, it's also unhealthy. Your body was not meant to 
It was not designed to handle worry in the doses you've been given it. And it's breaking down and it's having effects. When people say, I'm worried sick, they're telling the truth. They're getting sick from their, from their worry. Doctors say that a lot of people could be out of the hospitals, hospitals today if they were to somehow learn how to get rid of their guilt, resentment, and worry. Because that's, what, that's why they're in there in the first place. It's not so much what you eat. It's what eats you that's making you sick. It's the worry in your life. It causes all kinds of health problems. The Bible says this in Proverbs 12, 25, not in your notes. It says, an anxious heart weighs a man down. Some of you know, you know that feeling. Like just when you're anxious, it feels like you've just got the weight of the world. It's just pulling you down. Look at the opposite. Proverbs 14, 30 says, a heart of peace gives life to the body. Like, man, there is, when you have peace, there's energy, there's life, there's, there's, you want to be healthier? Stop worrying all the time. Never worry about anything. Why? Because it's unreasonable. It's unnatural. Here's the third thing Jesus tells us. He tells us that it's unhelpful. It's unhelpful. Worry cannot make you one inch taller. Worry cannot shed not one inch off your waistline or else it would have already on me. Oh my goodness. Worry does not, it, can, it can't make, worry does not prolong your life, but it sure can shorten your life. Worry can. Worry can't change the past and it can't control the future. It just messes up today. That's all it does. Worry does not change anything. No, let me get, worry can only change one thing. Worry does not change your circumstance. It changes you. That's what it does. Worry is going to change you and not in the way you need. It makes you miserable. It never solves a problem. Therefore, it's unhelpful. Here's the fourth reason why Jesus says, never worry about anything. That's why he's giving you that encouragement today. Stop it. Stop worrying. It's unnecessary is the fourth point. God says that in the world, like you're going to have trouble, but even in the middle of the pain, in the middle of the trial, what are you worried about? Don't you think I'm going to take care of you? Don't you know that I love you? Don't you know that I'm with you? Don't you know that I died for you? Don't you know that I put my spirit inside of you? Don't you know I'll bless you and I, you're my child? Don't you know? What are you worried about? about? Am I not a good father? It's unnecessary when we have such a good God. There's no need to worry. Jesus says in, in verse 30, if God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, think about all the beautiful flowers all over the world that no one, no human eye will ever see before they wither. Think about that, that God takes care of those flowers that are here today, gone tomorrow, won't he most surely care for you, O oh, you of little faith? You're as happy as you choose to be. If you're unhappy, it's because you're choosing to be unhappy. If you're worried, it's because you're choosing to be worried. Don't blame your husband. Don't blame your kids. Don't blame your, 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 your boss. It's a choice. It's, and so is worry. Worry is a choice. And you don't have to worry. So the first step to... Stress management is to refuse to worry about anything. Why? Because it's unhelpful, it's unreasonable, it's unnatural, and it's unnecessary. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, I love this translation of this verse. It says, unload, I love that word, unload. Unload all of your worries on God since he's looking after you. I love that word unload because it literally, in the, in the original Greek, it means just drop it. See, God isn't telling you to, to pick up that giant boulder of pain. God is not telling you to pick up that, 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 pick up whatever's stressing you out and worrying you in the difficult season, to pick it up and throw it as far away from you as possible with all your strength. He's not telling you to do that. All he's telling you is, let it go. Stop carrying it. Just drop it right there and I'll take care of it. Just drop it. Let go. Let go. Finally surrender that situation to God and let it go. So what do you do? What do you do with that anyway? The final statement Jesus made, he quotes from the Psalms. This statement, into your hands, I commit my spirit, is actually a psalm. Psalm 31, verse 4 through 5. Notice with me here the first two words. Free me. Free me from this pain, from this difficulty. Free me, from, free me from this trap that I set 
before me. For you're my refuge. And he, and he tells us, he tells us how to, the secret to be set free. The, the title of the message today is the seventh thing in, your, in the middle of your pain and your trial and your difficult season. The seventh thing you need to do is be free. How do you do that? What's the secret? He tells us right here. Here's the next line. Into your hands, God, I commit my spirit. That needs to be our prayer. Whatever you're facing today, if you want to be free, God, into your hands, I surrender. I commit my spirit. I'm believing that today, that there's some raiment in here for some of you that need to be free. There's something you're holding on to, a weight that is pushing you down, that, is car- that, that maybe you've been carrying for too long. And you need to finally surrender it to God and let it go and be free. How do you do that? Let's continue the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus actually shares with us how to surrender that to God, how to just commit it, commit your, commit your life into his spirit and commit your spirit into his hands. Let's continue Matthew chapter six. Here's the first thing that we need to do in order to be free. And that is get to know God. <laughs> you want to be free? You want to apply this principle of surrendering to God? This is, this is the secret to having confidence. And that's what you need. You need some confidence in the middle of the the trial. You need to know that you know that God is faithful. You need to have this trust, this faith that somehow you're able to tap into. And in order to tap into that, when you don't feel like tapping into it, and your mind is going elsewhere and you want to complain and criticize and hide yourself and point your finger and shift the blame, the, the only way you're going to be free and endure is if you know God. The more you know him, the more you're going to trust him. Amen. The more you know God, the more confidence you're going to have in God. Right. I'm not, and then I'm not talking about the kind of like to, to know about God. I'm not, I didn't say get to know about God. I said get to know God. This is a type of personal relationship because you can know about God a lot, but that's not going to set you free. That's not going to give you the confidence you need just because you come to church regularly, just because you know about God. No, 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 no. no. Even if you study and all that's great stuff, but you need to spend time with God. You need to have your own devotion time, your own prayer time, where you're alone with God, where you're getting to know him, where you're feeding from the word of God, not just coming in here and getting the overflow, overflow of my devotion with God. You need your own devotion with God. Okay? I mean, I mean, this is, I love it. I mean, I'm here to minister to you, you guys, and we are part of the family of God, and I'm sure you're going to be blessed by it, but this was never designed to get you through the bad season to get you through the trial and the difficulty. I can't do that for you. I wish I could preach that good, but I can't. Even if I could, you need to have your own person. You need to get to know God. You need to have your own devotion, your own relationship with him. Matthew chapter 6, continuing the Sermon on the Mount, verse 31, 32. Jesus says, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. I like the way the message translate, the message paraphrase says it. It says in verse 32, it says, people who don't know God and the way he works, they're the ones who worry. The The people who don't know God, the people who don't have a relationship with him and a relationship enough to know how my God works, his characteristics, his personality, that even when there seems to be no way, he always makes a way. I know my God works. The opposite of true is of this statement that people who do know God and the way he works, don't worry. The more you know God and the more you know how he works, the more you, will, you won't worry. Get to know God. The more you know someone, the more you're going to trust them. And if you don't know God, you ought to be worried. You will be. You you will. But there's a confidence when you know your God. You talk to people who served him faithfully, like for for years. Talk to them. They'll tell you. They'll testify. They will tell you how good their God is, how faithful he is. Some of you here need to take that leap of faith. Some of you need to just, just... Trust God into your hands, God. I I commit my spirit. Some of you need to be free. Here's the second thing we need to do in order to be free. And that is put God first in every area 
of your life. Put God first in every area of your life. And if you'll focus on his agenda, listen, if you'll focus on his agenda, he'll focus on yours. You won't have to be worried about your agenda, your needs. If you just focus on his will and his kingdom and his agenda, your needs will be taken care of. Look, this is what he says in verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, if you let something else take that place, that first place, you'll worry. You'll end up worrying in life. And this right here in this scripture is the secret to that abundant life that Jesus promises us.